even even just the kind of anecdotal discussions that I've had with dentists that have been with it, you know, my students in their hygiene clinicals and stuff like that, say that they didn't have that type of education that they're getting. That oftentimes their anesthesia course was, oh, here's the book, read the chapter, now go do that on your patient. That is a gift, right, that we can bring to our patients is saying, you know, I want to give you my best. I, you deserve my best. And so here I want, I'm getting you numb so that you get my best work because I don't want you to feel hurt. I don't want you to feel pain and I want you to get better and healthy. It's really important to remember that we are the ones that are the providing clinician for that and to stop and take a moment and review the patient's health history and make sure that the correct anesthetic has been selected, that we understand what contraindications they may have. Get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast Gygenist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Welcome to Hygiene Edge, you caters, a podcast just for dental hygiene educators brought to you by Jessica Atkinson, that's me. Shelly Brown, and Malia Lewis of Hygiene Edge. We have partnered with the Tale of Two Hygienists to bring you helpful information about being a dental educator. Thanks for chatting education with us. Make sure you're following us on Instagram at Hygiene Edge and subscribe to our YouTube for the latest videos full of tips and tricks for your career. Each episode, we will share information from dental hygiene educators to help you grow in your didactic and clinical instruction. Volume up and write it down. Let's get Hygiene Edge educated. Before we get to the interview, we want to say a big thank you to Paradise Dental Technologies, or PDT, for supporting the continuing education portion of this podcast for so many years. If you do not know already, many of our full-length episodes count for CE. You'll find the links in the show notes, or you can sign up for our newsletter by going to a tale of two When you sign up for the newsletter, we will periodically send out links to shows that have expiring CE courses attached. And none of this could be possible without the support of the amazing people over at PDT. So check out their hygiene and other instruments at pdtdental.com. That's pdtdental.com. Now, on to the interview. Welcome back, dental hygiene educators. We are happy to have you this maybe morning, maybe mid-afternoon, or maybe evening, December day. We have today with us teacher Tina to talk about one of the greatest gifts in dental hygiene, period, and also in dental hygiene education, as many of us are very passionate about this particular exciting thing. It's Christmas time and we've got teacher Tina here with us wearing a Santa hat and I would like her to introduce a little bit about herself as we get into our podcast today about the gift in dental hygiene. Well, Hygiene Edge family, thank you so much. You guys, first of all, before I do that. Let me fangirl and gush on you guys because I feel like it's a gift that you invited me to be a part of this. So thank you for making my holidays cheery and bright by seeing your three happy smiling faces. So I wish you guys could all see their happy faces too. Uh, yeah. So uh, thank you. Yes, my name is Tina Clark, also known as Teacher Tina. And I've been a dental hygienist for 20 years. And I am starting my 15th year of dental hygiene education. And kind of have done it all, all the way from clinical instructor, all the way through program director, and back to saying, you know, let me just get back into the clinic. And along that journey, local anesthesia became my passion. And I fell in love with it. And it started having more and more students coming to me, asking me questions about it. Once they graduated, there was asking questions. And then I started doing continuing education courses and so on and so forth. And it all kind of bled into and building Teacher Tina RDH. And we also fangirl about Teacher Tina RDH. And we love your mm-hmm. passion for local anesthesia because we here at Dental Hygiene Educators feel that local anesthesia is a gift. 
It really is a gift. And we're going to talk to you today about local anesthesia. And as dental hygiene educators, we want to direct you to resources that will help you be better at teaching. One of those resources is Teacher Tina. Yay! And also HygieneEdge.com. So please take a look at our website and for helpful tips and tricks for you as a dental hygiene educator, for your students, and for practitioners alike. So before we go on any further, we're going to open the gift of local anesthesia. So ta-da! Uh, teacher Tina did a very beautiful job. Now I feel like I have to call you Teacher Tina, not just Tina. <laughs> just like a, a really beautiful alliteration. <laughs> but she just did this lovely well, dance okay. move of opening a gift. So I, the gift of an- local anesthesia really started with advocacy. And I have seen the advocacy efforts in my own state as far as allowing dental hygienists to work to the scope of their education in practice. And it's crazy for me to think that local anesthesia wasn't available before I was born. Isn't that nuts? That is so crazy to me because it's something that I do every day when I practice hygiene. And it's something that I teach future hygienists to do as well. So Washington, bless Washington, was the very first state to legalize local anesthesia for dental hygienists in 1971. And then Tina's, that was about to teach her Tina. Tina's state of Oregon came along in 1975. And it wasn't until 1983 that our home state for us hygiene edgers legalized local anesthesia. It's crazy for me to think of practicing without that gift. So I just want to shout out. It's crazy that some states cannot do it still and hopefully we can work (laughs) towards that because I love getting patients numb you know it just makes it so much more comfortable for them and for me that I'll stress so much so hopefully we can all band together as hygienists and get these states that are not doing it being able to because it's a game band together I I think about this and I really want to give a huge shout out to those who advocate for us who spend their hours their money their time and efforts, their relationships, so many things go into advocating for things that we do every day and not think twice about it. This is something that I talk to students about all the time, why it's important to be members of their professional association, why it's important for them to be involved, is because they do things every day in their practice that isn't the normal practice for every dental hygienist. And that blows my mind that there are states... Let's we, we we're down to under five, hallelujah. But Georgia, Mississippi, Texas, and Delaware are still holding out and not allowing for educated, smart, gentle, wonderful dental hygienists to provide this gift to their patients. So here's a little plug to be a member of your professional association and to thank those who really go to bat for you to improve the way that you practice every day. And Jessica, we have to celebrate the newest state to join the anesthesia world of North Carolina. So any North Carolinans listening, welcome to the club. It's a happening club. We can all light it up and start singing shot, shot, (laughs) shot, 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 shot. Everybody, (laughs) right? (laughs) Give me your best shot. That's that's not the tune. That's not the tune. Somebody help me with the tune. Hit me with your best shot. Yes. Hit me with your best shot. I knew I was going to get some help. Fire away. I knew I was going to get some help. And well, that's the name of my anesthesia course, so I really that, should know it. <laughs> I actually play it every year, their very first day, the student's very first day in anesthesia clinic. I have that playing, hit me with your best shot. I think it really, you know, maybe calms some nerves. At least I hope so. <laughs> with, I, I think advocacy only happens through education. And that starts with educating legislators. It starts with educating other other fellow healthcare professionals. And you brought up your continuing education course, Tina. Is that for specifically hygienists? Is that, tell me a little bit about that education course that you offer. 
Right. So that, that anesthesia course, it's for any oral health care provider that can uh, do anesthesia. They've already done the basic courses. They're already licensed to do that within their state. So it's a refresher course for dentists, hygienists, anybody that can, uh, and dental therapists that are allowed to do local anesthesia. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And, you know, you know, when we were talking about education and talking about uh, educating our legislators, and I also think it's a reminder for the states that don't have anesthesia, that educating the rest of the dental team on what hygienists actually learn when we're in school, right? That we already learn pharmacology. We already learn head and neck anatomy. We already learn medical emergencies, all of those things that we have to know in order to be safe and effective with our injections. Absolutely. So, you know, that's, that comes into play a lot. There was an article, a research article written by Anna Teeter's Joanne Gorinlian and Jacqueline Frudenthal about that specific thing. The differences between dental school education and dental hygiene school education, local anesthetics specific. So I was looking at this earlier today and I found it really fascinating. They did a study on six dental schools and 29 hygiene programs in California were invited to participate, but only one dental school replied out of the six. And I'm looking at this right now, and I think it was, let's see here, 18 of the, I've got to make sure that I get this right here. Burp, 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 burp. The results were 18 local anesthetic course instructors or program directors participated in the study. Yep. So 18 of the, of the hygiene school and one of the dental school. And what was so fascinating to me is that the majority of the dental hygiene respondents reported teaching 12 types of intraoral injections. And then the dental school reported only teaching seven injection types. There were fewer student-to-student injection experiences per injection type at the that were required by the dental school than the dental hygiene school. And the dental school did not indicate a minimum number of student-to-patient injection requirements for graduation. In my program right now, we have approximately 32 hours of didactic education and 32 hours of clinical hygiene for specifically local anesthetics. And this does not include their pharmacology class. This does not include their medical emergencies class. This does not include their head and neck anatomy class. This is dental, local anesthetics specific. And in comparison, in this study, it's showing me that dental hygienists have more experience in school to prepare them to give anesthesia when they're out in practice. And these hygienists aren't giving the op- are not given the opportunity in some states. And that blows my mind. It blows my mind that we have the opportunity to give almost as many as in- as many injections in dental hygiene school. I mean, I'm doing blocks for quadrant scaling. I'm, I'm doing that all of the time. And so the educating part is making sure that your patients, your neighbors, your family, the legislators know that you have this education to do this safely. You know, Jessica, you know, you, you were talking about that study by like some amazing, you know, researchers and clinicians and hygienists Then you know, so it's what a great study, but even, even just the kind of anecdotal discussions that I've had with dentists that have been with it, you know, my students in their hygiene clinicals and stuff like that say that they didn't have that type of education that they're getting that oftentimes their anesthesia course was, Oh, here's the book, read the chapter. Now go do that on your patient. So without any kind of practice outside of doing it on direct patient care, without any kind of like feedback, just a doctor looking over their shoulder for a half of a second. Yep. Okay, good. You're, you're great. And not even watching the whole entire procedure. And, you know, the doctors that I've worked with have, are so impressed with the education that the hygiene students receive 
that um, and they're like, they've learned more. They're like, wow, I didn't know that about, you know, giving an IA or about giving a Gal Gates injection. They don't, they're like, I didn't realize that. No wonder why I was struggling right. so much with all of my injections because they didn't have that. I yeah. didn't even realize how high the missed IAs were out in practice because I didn't experience that very often in hygiene school. Did any of you experience a lot of missed IAs? I mean, it's in my anecdotal experience, it was very low. And I really feel like it's because of the thoroughness of our dental hygiene education. We're really teaching them how to look for landmarks. We're really helping them know where to go, why to go, and how to go in order for that to be an effective experience. It's a great idea. I kind of like just how you incorporate advocacy into your course, maybe even a little bit, you know, like talk about the history of how we reached local anesthesia and how we can go from here. Hopefully that'll help our students uh, see the benefit of advocacy as they graduate and move on. Because when we get into private practice, it's really hard to be involved in so many things. We're pulled so many different ways. So hopefully instilling that little bit of advocacy like in your class and then maybe in other classes too can make a big difference in like the future of hygiene. Absolutely. So, and because I think honestly, the future of hygiene, it has to do with advocacy. It That's how things change. That's exactly change. how things change. And advocacy looks a lot of different ways. You don't have to be the person standing on Capitol Hill, but you do have to be involved in one way or another. And to be honest, one of the biggest ways is put your money where your mouth is. And the reason why certain yep. groups get so much done legislatively is because they have the money. And so when you're wondering what uh, if something is worth your money or time, ask yourself next time you're giving an injection, if you are able to in your state, and go, hmm, maybe it is worth this. Maybe it is worth advancing my professional abilities because I, I have been educated to do these things and I can do these things safely and I want to do these things safely and I want to provide these things for my patients and to really stay involved. Even if you can't do it with your time, do it with your money and do it with your conversations with your patients. I was listening to a conversation actually that you had Tina with Marion Mansky and you're talking about mm -hmm. some of the biggest and best proponents that can help us legislatively are our patients and talking about your to your patients that if you have to wait for something if you have to wait for your dentist to come and give a block just say hey wouldn't it be nice if I could give you this block I mean I was just doing it yesterday when I was in Utah with my license but today I I, I mean, I've got a house in Georgia, and here in Georgia, I can't do it. But yesterday, I was in Utah, and I was doing these really great. Or a situation if you're infiltration only. If you're in Alabama and you're waiting for, a, you know, the somebody to get numb. Well, Jessica, to talk about, like, the infiltrations, I've had hygienists from New York reaching out to me saying, help. I can only do infiltrations. And here I am like having to stick my patient right. over and over and over and over again. And especially on the mandible, uh, like that can be a challenge unless you have the right anesthetic, which I can't wait until we talk about that right anesthetic teaser, <laughs> teaser. Okay. So anyway, um, but how, how much they struggle with time, how much time it takes and uh, how much anesthetic they have to use in order to be able to get a, a whole quadrant or half mouth. Right. Numb. And to have a conversation with your patient saying, this took this much anesthetic and it was uncomfortable for you for I, this many times. I am educated to do this in one go if I were to go higher up on the nerve block and they would say, or on the nerve, they'd say, well, why can't you do it? Well, in this state, they don't uh, it's not legal for me to do it that way. And to really get your patients to advocate for you as well. When we treat our patients to the, the standard of care that we were taught in school, they trust us and they want us to be able to do the best for them. And as we use them as a part of our advocacy, I think that is really profound and helpful for us to see things move in, a, in an upward direction. 
<laughs> I, I just want to talk a little bit about ed- the education that we offer in hygiene school. And for you hygiene educators out there that are looking for help making their local anesthesia courses more impactful, this is a conversation for you. So I taught, I started teaching local anesthesia in 2020. It was my very first year teaching. It was the spring of 2020. And we all know what happened in the spring of 2020. And so we went, I went from half of that semester was online. And there are some great options for you as far as a virtual learning platform in order to help students have some experience before they get into a patient's mouth. And the one that I, I, do you use any, Tina, in your, your school, do you use any virtual? In the, it, not any of the virtual. We actually, it's so funny because we were just talking about it today uh, about some of the virtual ones and, and going down that path. So I'm excited to hear what you have to say about so it. So I, I've been, um, there was, they did a free trial for the dental edutech dental local anesthesia simulator simulator not stimulator um and i I had them use that as part of their practice and it was really helpful for those who chose to use it at the time i didn't have a lot of experience with it so i had it as an optional resource but those who were using it really appreciated it. And so what it essentially does is it helps you locate your landmarks. It helps you know if you're in the right direction, helps you as far as your insertion depth, all of those things virtually. And so when they got back into clinic, they had at least some sort of interfacing with what that would look like in a mouth, although it was a simulated mouth. So my question for you, because these are, this is one of my questions that came up was, you know, when the students do that simulator and then they go into the patient's mouth, did that lower their anxiety level a little bit? Do you, you know, think? that is something that I would like to see some study on. As far as my anecdotal yeah. experience, I am not sure those who are the most nervous used the simulator. So I, I haven't tracked the most nervous. That is something that I'll do next semester. I'm like, who's the mo- who here is the most concerned about, I'm going to use, I'm going to just do a little, little bit of a study on you and see how that impacts it. I hope that it would be a situation where they feel less concerned about using the needle in someone's mouth. I, as far as my educate, my teaching approach, I would like to give them as many opportunities outside of the mouth to get them familiar with what it may look like inside of the mouth. So all of us in school, like I remember doing it on an orange and a peach and a hot dog, a number of different things. We practiced positive aspirations with a little bit of food coloring. And then I moved down to Southern Utah and we had these incredible there, I'm trying to remember who is the manufacturer, but we have anest- we have actual anesthesia models, the mannequins, the mannequins that do the buzzer. Well, I know that Kilgore I has who one. It is Kilgore, and they yeah. have the buzzing. Yeah, because yeah, so Kilgore has one where you know it it has the cheeks and and everything, and uh, when you get to a certain landmark or a certain aspect, it will a buzz. And I can't remember if it's, if it'll buzz, if you're in the right spot, I think it buzzes when you're in the right spot. Cause I was, I was thinking, Oh, like yes. operation, except it's operation exactly. buzzes at you when you're wrong. <laughs> it's like an opposite but operation. This one I think, yeah, but it buzzes at you. Yes. Like ding, 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 winner, winner, chicken dinner. Right. You got your right. You hit the right spot. So, uh, so yeah, I think there are lots of options out there. I also have had the opportunity to be in a variety of settings for local anesthesia And I think overall, whether or not you have the access to really fancy educational additions like the simulator or the Kilgore model, or maybe you have a shortage of hot dogs in your area, I'm not sure. But I think what it is, is to really allow the student to have practice. Yeah. Another really good aid for helping with practicing injections is there's the, um, I think it's called the safety needle 
or something. I think that's the name of it. And I should have looked it, it up has right a ball before, on but it. it basically it looks like a little yeah, it has a little ball at the end. So it screws on just like a needle. And then so the, pay, the student can go inside their classmate's mouth and practice their point of insertion and their angulation uh, just to be able to make sure, you know, just practice coming in and out of the mouth, practice, you know, retraction without poking, worrying about poking their finger, kind of lowering that, that first step in anxiety. Yeah. I think a big thing with lowering their anxiety and just having giving injections a positive experience and like teaching it is the instructor, right? Because mm-hmm. a lot of instructors, they may have not have learned it in school. So they've had to pick it up while they're in private practice. They Maybe they only give it like once a month. So when they start teaching, they're like, I don't feel super comfortable giving injections. So they're not like maybe apt to like recommend it or be like, we should numb like all these patients that have fives, you know, they'd be like, if you can get away with it, just don't numb them. But I think as instructors, if we're like, yeah, let's give them all the opportunities and I'm going to keep this super positive and like be really excited when they're going to give an injection on the patient and really like um, show them how awesome it can be. They can do such a better job. I think that really affects the students a lot. I've noticed that in my years of teaching is if they've haven't had uh, instructors that are pushing them to do it, then they're a little bit more fearful to do it themselves. But if the instructors are like, let's do it. Like, this is going to be awesome. It's worth it. Then they're like, yeah, like, let's do it. Like they're great to join in. So. Students a lot of times talk patients out of anesthesia, right? Have you ever seen them be like, Oh, you, you, we could try it first without. And I'm like, no, no, no. Let's just tell them that they need it. And, you know, go from there. I think that that's really important. Because they do. It's not an option. Because they do need it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I tell my students, like, don't give them the option, right? If you're going to say, would you like to get numb? Of course they're going to say no. Who one's going to be like, yeah, of course. Like, let's get me numb, you know? So I'm like, when they go to the dentist, they get a filling. They have a disease, cavity. The dentist doesn't give them an option. Like, we can maybe get you numb, maybe if it's small. But they really don't give them an option a lot of times. So why are we giving them the option too? You know, I don't know. Right. I just and feel like let's you're not. Right. <laughs> and it's like that with practically any other medical procedure, right? You don't have, you don't go to any other medical procedure and say you have to go get a mole removed. They're not going to be like, well, we'll try <laughs> cutting a mole off without getting you numb, right? No, they're, you know, they're going to anesthetize around that area. They'll put their own lidocaine around there and, and, and take care of it. So it really is, it's. We, we do need to encourage and that's, students that's to that education like, piece grasp again. it and yeah. push and it. And that's the that education yeah. piece again, where mm-hmm. you're educating the patient that they have a disease process in the mouth. You have an infection. You have an active infection. When I go to the dermatologist and they're going to cut a mole, I know what that is like. But many people, because of the nature of periodontal disease, the slow process, it doesn't hurt until your tooth is wobbling out. It's just such a slow process. You, as the the dental provider, the health care provider, need to educate your patient. I am going to be performing a procedure that necessitates anesthesia. These are the areas that we are going to get numb in order to arrest this disease. So when you're talking to a patient or when you're talking to a student for you educators, give them the example of Shelly from last appointment. We took a lot of information that from your mouth. We talked about the space between your tooth and your gums, and you had some areas of active disease. In order to treat those areas, we need to get you numb for you to be comfortable and for me to do what I need to do in order to stop this disease process. Would you like pina colada or strawberry for your topical? (laughs) Oh, I want pina colada, please. Can I have and we pina won't colada? say topical. We'll say I, I, now that I'm thinking, like, and this is a progression. You you're gonna get better and better and better at this as you have these inter interfaces with your students and with patients. And say I'm going to place some numbing jelly on your gums in order for this process to be more comfortable for you. Would you like pina colada or cherry? You know, I think I think oftentimes yeah. we we forget to extend 
our understanding of this disease process to our patients. And in that failure, we really cut ourselves off at the knees and people are like, oh, that was just a cleaning. The two words that we hate, just and cleaning. No, we are doing a therapeutic <laughs> process. Like we are, we are really doing something much more than being a cleaning lady. You know, Jessica, you, what you were talking about brings up a really good point and idea and something that um, I think I want to start incorporating more with my students is having them practice that dialogue with their student partner of saying, all right, so um, now I'm going to go be, go ahead and place this topical anesthetic or this numbing gel, the pre, the pre anesthetic yeah, like solution, you know, all, all the different, all the different terms that are age appropriate, right? Cause we have to talk about that, but giving them that opportunity to practice that and to, and that they're seeing that behavior modeled and, uh, so that way, when they do have to cross that bridge with their patient, that they already have practiced that that terminology. They've already practiced that that speech, so to speak, uh, with their patient. Because um, you know, I think a lot of times students are afraid of how to tell them. So instead of saying anything, they just they're like, "Oh, well, you don't have to do it. You know, we're not going to do it." Instead of actually being confident and brave enough to have the conversation. With Absolutely. The and in this conversation, I'm just even thinking in my own interactions with my students that I want to do a better job at helping them steer that conversation in a direction of best practice. And best practice would be to get a patient numb when you're doing quadrant scaling. Best practice would be to offer the highest level of care to your patient. So that is a really good reminder for me and how to help a student when they're having that conversation and they look at you and they're like, well, I mean, patient really doesn't want to get numb. And when you come in and say, well, I'd love to come in and support you in that conversation. What have you already told them? What, how'd that conversation go? And I, I can come and help you explain anything that they have questions about. And they may have a question about, I'm allergic to epinephrine. And then you're like, okay, We'll, we'll use something. We'll use. <laughs> okay. And you're still alive. Good job. Good job. And I've never taught in a dental school, but I now I'm super fascinated to kind of think about how the dental schools, how dental students approach it. Are they nervous right. too? Or is it just an expectation? Cause you went to the dentist, you got a cavity, you got numb before you started school. You knew you do did that. But maybe hygiene, hygiene students don't know that. That's what they're getting into. They've only had profies their whole I life. Have, you know? I have had students. Students yeah. might not have that education. I have had students that That's go, a great point. Yeah. Great point. I didn't know this was what I was going to be doing. Yeah. No, I've had students say, oh, I didn't know, which they shadowed. I feel like they should have known. But she's like, I thought I only polished. And one time I had a student come like, I didn't know that gums bled. And I'm like. They do. We're up to our elbows in blood, you know? So it's just... Oh, oh the story. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just kind of fascinating. Anyway, so if there's any dental instructors out there, please message us. You can write us at hello at Hygiene Edge. I would love to hear your experiences with dental students, how they respond when it's like their first injection. Are they nervous? So they're just like, okay, we're going for right. it, you know? And is it that because they're feeding off their professors? Or are they feeding off their past experience? Anyway, just that should be an interesting research study. One yeah, day. that would be that would be that fly on the oh, wall on that. Yeah. I think that would be cool. I want to. Will you let me know? Fill me in. I want to know. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, Jessica. I started thinking about you know the supportive conversations that we can have with the students when when they're fearful of doing an injection, and you know one of the one of the things that I like to talk with the students about is you know do you do you want to hurt your patient? Like you're not here doing this and you're not, you don't want to hurt them. You don't want them to be in pain. And do you think that you will actually be able to confidently get down into that five, six millimeter pocket where you've got this tenacious, moderate calculus? Do you confidently think that you can do that without hurting your patient, giving that, that treatment area your best work? And they're like, probably not. So then you have to say, well, then the way to Give your patient your very, very best is to know that they are comfortable and that they are not in pain. And that is a gift, right, that we can bring to our patients is saying, you know, I want to give you my best. I, you deserve my best. 
And so here I want, I'm getting you numb so that you get my best work. Cause I don't want you to feel hurt. I don't want you to feel pain and I want you to get better. And I'm totally okay with you saying, I want to give you a gift. The gift was in 1983, it was made legal that I could give you an injection. And here we go, because this is going to make this not only a better experience for you now, but the standard of care for periodontitis is non-surgical periodontal therapy. And I'm going to be able to do the best I can in order for you to have better results. Uh, These are going to be better results. You're going to have a much better outcome because I gave you this injection. I do want to talk a little bit about what you were saying, Malia, your instructor's attitude, what they bring to the table when they're, you know, watching the student, and it might be an injection that they've never done. I was not taught in practice in dental hygiene school. It was not a clinical injection that we gave. I was probably told it in a PowerPoint somewhere, so this is probably my own, maybe I slept during this one slide, I'm not sure, but I started teaching at an institution that I was not my alma mater, and one of the students said, I'd like you to watch me on an AMSA, and I said, oh, do you mean the MSA or the ASA, or or, do you mean both of those, and she goes, no, the AMSA, and I said, oh, okay, just give me a minute, and I ran to what we call our fishbowl, which is where we keep all of our books. And I looked it up and lo and behold, there is actually a palatal injection called the AMSA. I took a few minutes, I read up on it, and I went back into that that student's operatory and I said, all right, let's do this. What do you got? <laughs> and really giving yourself the, a moment to catch up or to ask another instructor to get you to a place where you feel comfortable observing something that maybe you were not aware of. Because I felt that I had been given enough education and I had been practicing long enough that I put two and two together. We made four. She gave a beautiful AMSA injection. And now it's one of my favorite injections to give and is like the hygiene silver bullet. I did that once with the maxillary, the same, the same thing. I was like, oh, I'm going to, re- I read about it in the book and I was like, I'm just going to give one. <laughs> and I did. It was great. It worked. <laughs> well, I think it works that way because of the past experience and past education that you've had, that you can easily take that information and adapt it to something you've, you're learning that's new, right? You're able to assimilate that Prior Absolutely. Knowledge. So if there are a bunch a of you easier. educators out there that this is your first time in the local anesthesia, anesthesia clinic and you're feeling a little nervous, there are resources for you to brush up on injections in order for you to feel confident with your students and give them a better experience than maybe you had. You know, I think that's an important thing. You, um, I also was thinking about how important it is to have instructor calibration with your injections as well. You know, if, if there would have been a moment, we all know sometimes there isn't time for that on the spot, but if there would have been a moment to have a calibration with everybody on, this is, this is where we are looking when we're talking about an IA, a PSA, an AMSA, you could have been like an AMS, what? (laughs) Oh, the AMSA. Okay. I'm, I'm seeing this, I'm learning it. So you know, the importance of having those calibration moments is is key. Absolutely. I remember the very first time I was in anesthesia clinic and looking at the schedule and making sure I looked up the injections before I went into that clinic. And at that time, there wasn't any information online on how to give those injections. There weren't any videos. And that was one of the biggest motivators for Shelly Malia and I to start Hygiene Edge and I think our injection videos are our most watched videos. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. When I, I think calibration is really important, even about little things like your, um, that you might not even think about, like your clinics or your school's policy on like medical emergencies or little things like that. Because I remember when it was my first time teaching in 
the lab with, um, we were giving injections. Very first injection we gave this cute student, she gave the injection and came out and then she just rested her hand on the tray. And I was like, oh, don't forget to recap. And I look at her and she just fell to the ground. And I was like, <gasps> what do I do? Like, I had no idea. I had no calibration. It was my first time. And I was like, what's the policy? But like little things like that happen, just little calibrations every day might be really helpful, especially for your brand new instructors. We haven't seen Capi. We haven't seen Capi. Do I cap the yeah. shrimps first or do I help her? I don't know what to do. It was, it was a very <laughs> weird dilemma for my life. But we worked it out. She I, did great. I'd love to know, <laughs> I'd love to know oh, um, how you guys are calibrated <laughs> on different types of anesthetic. I know we're going to talk about Articane here in a bit. Maybe this is a great time to segue, but I'd love to know what your thoughts are on types of anesthetic that each of you use in your clinics. As far as I'm thinking about calibration, I, I think the anesthetics you use are patient specific. I, I mean, the only calibration that, that I have off the top of my head is we're not using any basal constrictor in lab when we do our local anesthetic clinic. And as far as, uh, every single patient, that's more of a patient specific situation. And I'm trying to get the students to think about what is my patient presenting with and why am I going to use the anesthetic I'm using? And so they're currently in the midst of doing a case study in their advanced theory course on one of their NSPT patients, and I'm asking them why are don't just tell me what anesthetic you're going to be using. Tell me why you're going to use it, because I think every practitioner has favorites, and I think every practitioner has a different reason why they use something. For me, going into practice, a lot of the things that I used was habit. So in school, at that time. We never used Articane on a lower block. And so going into practice, I never used Articane on a lower block. And I was taught really well as far as how to give a lower block. And I had very few failures. I can't even think of a time that I, I, IAs are like my, my jam. I, I feel like IAs and I were a match made in heaven. Those are, though. that's a particular injection that's really has been really respondent to my application. And so they were. I, I haven't really had fails in IA. So I, it never pushed me to think about using something else. So I think a lot of it's habit. And I would like my students to be better than I was. And instead of a habit to really think critically of why do I want to use this particular anesthetic? Yeah, you know, and Shelly, when you're talking about calibration, when you're ta uh, with your anesthetics, it also comes to kind of what Jessica alluded to is what calibrating with what does the current research show? And, you know, there are still several schools that do not allow Articane for a lower block because at one point in time, there was this one little article that was put out that said, oh, you know, Patients get paresthesia if you use Articane on a, on a block. But now we have a lot of current data and a lot of current research that says, actually, that's no different than using even like 4% seat and nest. Like 4% Articane, 4% seat and nest have the same, basically, uh, statistically relevant paresthesia rates. And so just getting to the point of going, okay, so... The reason why we are not using this, is it based in, in science and facts, or is it based off of habits and traditional thought process due to a letter that was sent out by an insurance company that was trying to increase their, uh, their malpractice insurance rates and their malpractice insurance clients. And so they sent this letter out to lots of dentists saying that Articane causes paresthesia. And then they were told to retract that. They couldn't say that, but the word had already been put out. And so everybody got scared. So they got scared away from giving, using Articane when 
now we we see that is okay, but there are a lot of institutions, a lot of instructors who had that thought and are not certain if they can or cannot use it. And the number one reason for paresthesia, number one reason is practitioner failure. It's the practitioner yes. application. So as far as education is concerned, it is really important for you as dental hygiene educators to focus on teaching the students how to locate their landmarks, how to navigate anomalies, and how to feel confident in doing the thing. I have a question uh, for you, local anesthesia teachers, because it was just I was thinking about the other day. So I know a lot of textbooks say after you give injections, sit your patient up and monitor for five minutes. But do you teach that or have you seen any research that says do not sit them up? I only do it for the gal gates just so that way the anesthetic has time. Gravity can work with the anesthetic and allow it to bathe with the nerve. But, you know, and you don't have to sit them. I don't necessarily sit them all the way up. I just kind of bring them up a little bit and work on some other items, whether it's, you know, some charting or gathering up, switching out instruments or anything like that. What about you, Jess? That is what do you not do? a common... I do not have them monitor them for five minutes before they start doing something. So I, I'll, I don't say sit them up and don't do anything and just wait for five minutes. But I do have the, you're going to be monitoring them and looking for anything that's going on. So it's not like a stop, sit them up, unless it's an injection that you need a little bit of help from the gravity. But after you saying that, Malia, I think it might be a really great opportunity for them to sit the patient up and do their notes right then, how much anesthetic they used, what, you know, do their math right then gives them a little bit of time to really follow that suggestion. I have not looked at any research, so I am, I'm making notes while we're doing this podcast of things that I'm yeah. like. No, I've just heard both, but I always leave them back like personally. So they stay, so the gravity yeah. helps. I think this, get in more I, I, you know, I think but. this is one of the reasons why I love this hygiene educator podcast is educators learn so much when we get together and we start talking about the things that are the, the, the current research, what we have in our books, what we're doing in practical application and how to make that more applicable for our students. So, I mean, I've got some notes here of, let's see, look at the five minutes, talk about how to do role plays with your students on patients who are saying no thanks and having them really practice those things in order for them to feel more confident in real life situations. Yeah. Having them be very confident in the, um, the calculations is so, so important. I remember when I graduated, especially because I hate math. Yeah. I had graduated and, um, I was work temping at this office and the, I had to anesthetize for wisdom teeth extractions and the assistant handed me 21 carpules on this little 100 pound you know 15 year old girl and I was like oh that's a lot and she goes oh that's what the other hygienist gives I was like 21 carpules of lidocaine I'm I'm like I was like I could do the math I gotta do the math here (laughs) and it was way less than 21 Uh uh-huh exactly (laughs) 10 too many (laughs) yeah 10 too many and I think I mean I'm getting into my vulnerable space here. I know it's not a shock that I'm not the best at math, but I got into the habit of saying one half carp lido, IA. You know, quarter carp, articane, mm-hmm. MSA. And I got into that habit. And then I got a job where I was teaching anesthesia. And to be honest, that was. The one of the hardest things for me to really uh, teach well is because I hadn't been in practice. So you don't know where life's going to take you. And I just say, if you start out right, just keep going right. Don't don't get lazy like moi and keep your math skills strong so you're not giving 21 carbs to a 15 year old. Yeah. No. Oh, gosh. That just I was thinking medical emergency. Oh, golly. (laughs) 
And, and honestly, like, if you have to use 21 carpules, you're doing something wrong with your technique. Like, are you anesthetizing their toes, thinking that they're going to get numb up in their teeth? I'm trying For to real, figure it out. Like, <laughs> wow. And that, and Shelly, I think that just goes to show for you, like, you recognize that you are responsible for what you give the patient. And it's not the dentist, it's you. And I think uh, as far as advocacy, when we talk about whether or not a hygienist is educated enough to take on that responsibility, we are. And it is our responsibility to continue in those good practices and to when you see 21 carps on a tray go, hmm. I'm pretty sure that's not the maximum recommended dose. And yet you may be, find yourself in some habits that could use a refresh and a rebrand. And hopefully it won't take you teaching local anesthesia to get back to your good old math. You know, Jessica, you said something about, you know, that brings up another point about, you know, the hygienist is the one that's responsible. And, you know, several times there's hygienists that will go in and do the anesthesia for the doc right before a procedure. And, you know, they, it's easy to get into the habit, right, of walking into the operatory going, oh yeah, the doc's already come in and said hi, or the dental assistant has reviewed the health history and they set everything up for me. So all I have to do is come in. If the topical's already placed, I just come in, shoot them up and walk out. But it's really important to remember that we are the ones that are the providing clinician for that and to stop and take a moment and review the patient's health history and make sure that the correct anesthetic has been selected, that we understand what contraindications they may have, that, oh, they're cardiovascular, cardiovascular compromised, we got to watch our epinephrine here or all of the, all of the things. Or, you know, if the system was like, well, that's what the doctor wanted is, and you don't agree, then to say, hey, doc, you know, I don't understand why we're using lidocaine for this procedure when we could be using, when we should be using like a plane, like a mepivacaine plane for this procedure because of the patient's conditions. So, you know, really important to have that. And even if you have a doc over you, it is your, the provider, you have One to take One thing that's interesting for hygiene students is that I feel like anesthetizing, um, for periodontal therapy is a little bit different than anesthetizing for a restorative. And we don't really teach so much the restorative anesthesia in hygiene school. So I feel like sometimes they're learning that on the job and that can be a little bit of a challenge to know like, Oh, what do I do for number nine? You know, they give an ASA and you're like, no, they want probably a local <laughs> or if they're doing a crown, maybe they want a palatal you know, so having those conversations, reminding them that it might be different when you work in private practice, you have the basics, but your dentist, you know, difference. collaborate with them. Yeah. Right. And the shock to the system when they go, oh, I need That's to actually exactly give more the biggest anesthetic difference is because the amount. we need really, really, you know, that popal anesthesia and confirmed popal anesthesia. Jinx, owe me a Coke. <laughs> well, now neither yeah, of them can talk to you. That was the biggest thing for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, that is a gift. Speaking of happy holidays, a gift of local anesthesia is the ability for dental hygienists to do it in their offices. And that is a huge help to the doc, to the dentist that you are working with it is a huge help. And they are able to really make their time efficient. And as you work with the doc that you are working with, you can find out what they like, what you like, and come up with a an understood practice for certain applications of anesthesia. So you're both on that same page. And I, I mean, I love, I was one office that I did all the anesthesia and I learned so much. I, I, I learned that some kids don't react well to kitty cocktails and back off a little bit. <laughs> I also just learned a ton of different things that really made me better at local anesthesia. So gift to the practice, gift to the patient, all the way around, it's a gift. I think it's important too to remind the students um, that there are laws still around anesthesia 
and they need to know what they can give in their state. For example, I have a lot of students who, after they graduate, they come back and say, my dentist wants me to anesthetize before they arrive in the practice. They're on their way. Can I give anesthesia? And I'm, I say, no, you cannot until they're in the building. And so they're putting the hygienist license at risk sometimes. And if that's, you know, something that you see happen a lot, that's where that advocacy comes in. Let's maybe change the supervision on anesthesia in your state. If that's something that the dentist, it's a convenience for the hygienist to be able to do that. You know, that would be, that would be great for the dentist, but you can't legally do and that. So it's not you. worth jeopardizing. Yeah. Shelly, you are so right. Um, I worked for a doctor for years and years and years before he retired. And in Oregon, it's general supervision. He was actually in Canada moose hunting. And I was still at the office doing hygiene care and didn't have to stop anything. Got to see every single type of patient, saw all of, did all of the scaling and the root planings and didn't have to worry about anything because of the all of the advocacy and all the hard work that the hygienists did for me to make that happen. So, and then it is, it's important to understand that. And also to know that if you are in a state where you have general supervision, that it's okay for you to go ahead. And you're and, in a state and, like Utah. Yeah, embrace the power. And, yeah. Embrace it. And, but if you are in Utah, do not embrace power that you do not have and use it to educate who you work <laughs> with and say, you're right. This would be really convenient. It would be really nice for you to go moose hunting and for me to be at the office on a Friday and do quadrant scaling and all of see all of your NSPT patients while you're doing whatever you'd like to do. How about you work with your professional association and help us be able to help you? And I think that that's something that I dream about. I just dream about us recognizing our abilities and our education and really working towards giving our patients the best care possible. Because listen, I will do the same thing you do if we have a medical emergency with local anesthesia. And I also will do my very best because the best way to prevent a medical emergency is with reviewing the medical history. So if you can start off right, you're generally going to be able to avoid a medical emergency. And all hygienists are educated very well on looking at that medical history, doing an interview, and recognizing what is the potential risk here. And am I going to take that risk with my license? That's up to you. So educate. Be in, be a partnership with your office you have things to offer. These are the gifts that you can give because you are educated to give them. And if you, as a dental hygiene educator, if you're looking for help to give this gift more effectively, please reach out to Teacher Tina as she is our local anesthesia guru. She is our local anesthesia wonder woman. And give yourself a nice holiday gift and look her up on teachertina.com. Correct. Teacher Tina, Tina RDH. Yep. No, nope. Teacher Tina RDH.com. Yep. So you can yep, okay. go to Teacher Tina RDH.com. And actually, when you go there, there's a uh, anesthesia guide that I've put together. So you can sign up and you get that free straight to your email box. And there's a guide that has, uh, oh gosh, I think is it 11 or 12 now. I already forgot. I should have it memorized at uh, injections. Uh, for everybody. So you can print it off, send, tell your students to check it out, and they can have that nice guide right there for them too. Pictures and such. And you guys like all of your videos. And not only a guide. <laughs> we, we do love our videos, and our videos are available to you on YouTube under Hygiene Edge and at hygieneedge.com. So go ahead and take a look and find some helpful tips and tricks to make your anesthesia more effective and make your teaching of anesthesia a little easier. Another thing that Tina offers is if you or any of your students have any questions, Tina, where can they oh, find yes. you every so, week? You can see me live every Tuesdays on Instagram or on Facebook at teacher Tina RDH, and that's 
both of those, Instagram and Facebook. And I do Tuesdays with Tina. And oftentimes I have people will email me or send me direct messages asking questions. And that's when I share some of my hints and tips of things from anesthesia, clinical life, uh, sometimes even interviewing tips and such like that. So it's a lot of fun. And I love it when everybody asks me questions. Because it helps me learn. I think I learn more by when people are asking me questions. I'm like, ooh, I didn't think about that, right? Absolutely. And we would like to cultivate an environment here at Dental Hygiene Educators of questions and answers and conversation and the opportunity for us to grow as educators in order to help our students be the best they can be. So happy 50 years of the gift of dental hygienists giving local anesthetic. 1971 to 2021. All of the gifts that have been given that have been able to help patients get the most out of their their dental hygiene care and our hygienists being able to give that gift to their patients, their offices, and the community at large. And if you have any questions for us, you can always find us on all of our social media handles. Malia, list them for me. You can find us on Instagram, which is at Hygiene Edge, and also on Facebook. We have a private Facebook group too, which is a great think tank. If you ever um, have a question and you want to talk to other hygienists, you can join that. It's a group on Facebook as well, just called Hygiene Edge. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube. That helps us a ton. It also gives us a lot of feedback, what people like, what people don't like, and then we can keep making really helpful videos for you as a clinician, but also as a teacher. So if you need any other helpful videos... In regards to dental, local anesthetic, or anything else, give us a shout out and happy holidays to everyone. I hope that you will continue to advocate for yourselves and for others in order to continue giving good gifts.